I mean, I was born in three rooms. Uh, we had no electricity. We had one water tap for three families in the backyard. The toilet was in the backyard. But we thought we were lucky because everybody lived like us. My house is a three bedroom house. Got a garden and that. That's it. And a kitchen. And the living room. I spent all my young, early childhood playing on all the bomb sites around here, which was quite, you know, plenty of things to do. And there was a bomb church at the bottom of this turn in here called St Stephen's, and it was a, it was a magical place to play. It was all overgrown, and it, it's something like in the, you're seeing these old films now. And we used to spend hours climbing about and playing in here. I'm out like every day after school till like nine o'clock or something come back home and play. I normally just stay in my state and ride around, meet new friends. Uh, go around to hang around with people, play football with other people that just like underneath here, there's this park, I play football there. I used to live down the, the they, used to, they called it the Little Usher, which was the other side of the Rome and going down towards the canal. So in them days, if you want to play football, just take your football out and you had no trouble with traffic or nothing like that because no one had cars and all, we, all you ever got was my my windows. In the street that was our playground because there was no motorised units. It was all horse-drawn traffic. And as I said earlier on, we make a paper ball and kick it around. Then the police on foot will come and chase you around. I don't spend much time out. Most of the time I'm in my house. Whenever you're bored, just pick up a controller and just play the whole time as you want. I like them games because it's like realistic. FIFA, 09. Sega Tennis. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Call of Duty on PS3. Gears of Wars. We played all sorts of games. I mean, Tibby Cat, Tin Can, Copper, Rounders, all sorts of games, everything. And you made up your games yourself. You played marbles. <coughs> Uh, there were seasons of things. You played with cigarette cards, flicking them up the wall and things like this for a season. Then you played marbles and then you played gobs. Uh, what they call them jacks now, five stones. Jolt Ford was like a village. Uh, other parts were just somewhere else. If you cross over the Canal Bridge to go into Bethnal Green, it was like going to another country. You knew everybody where you lived. You never went very far from there. Uh, your parents w went out to work and they travelled a bit farther, but it was just the same. It was a community all round. We had so many aunts and uncles that, well, you never realised till later that they have no relation to you, but that you called everybody aunt this and uncle that. The thing that I like about Imbo is that it's about everyone there that's basically nice to get along with. Everywhere you go, yeah, you see people, they're all friendly, they get, you get to know them and they like help you out if you're in trouble, you could go to anyone. Yeah, it was territorial. Um... Under Tom Thumb's Arch was a, a, a um, I've told this story many a time. Under Tom Thumb's Arch, there was an off license that used to sell beer on draft. One of my jobs quite often was to go under there with a jug to get my dad's beer. And I went under there one day, and a gang from that side of the, the arch that I knew chased me back through the arch, and I dropped the jug in the middle of the arch with my dad's beer in, and I ended up getting a wallop and had to go to bed <laughs> as soon as I got home because the, the, not only the jug got broke, but my dad's beer went down there, the swanee. And when different area birds come down, like you get scared just in case they come up to you, might say something like beat you up for no reason. Just give, you just get beaten up for nothing that you have done wrong. I was with my cousin and we were in Elephant Castle and they asked us what ends we from, like uh, postcodes and stuff like that. So. We, we acted like we didn't know English, like stupid, so they were like ask, asking away from uh, Colombia. And when we came out, there was more boys there, and there was this guy in a bicycle, he called us, and then we started running, and we went inside this barber shop. We would have gang fights, and they would bring their champion round, and we would have our champion, and they would, you'd make a ring, and the two fighters would fight each other. In fighting, there's no rules, no one now. No, no. If you kicked anyone, you was a coward, you didn't kick someone. You had to stand up and fight properly. Every school had its venue where there was going to be a fight. Playtime, they say there's going to be a fight round, like where one was in Mill Yard, just off of Cable Street. Be a fight round Mill Yard this, this afternoon. You go round, you stand round, the two fellas get in the, in the, in the, in the, in the centre, they'll have a fight, that'll be finished.
Where did I meet girls? Was um, usually um, on the street corner, in uh, outside the pictures. I met my wife at, at the youth club, and I blackmailed her into coming out with me. They wanted tickets for a dance they couldn't get, and I could, and so I said, "I'll get you tickets for the dance if you come to the pictures with me." You know. She said no, but her friend said, "Oh yes, you can," and so she did, and we went out to the pictures, and it poured a rain. <laughs> I remember seeing her home to her gate and because we was all gentlemen then and I saw her home to her gate and I got soaking wet by the time I got home. And every time I met her after that it rained so I must have thought something of her because we stayed together all this time. Whenever you wanted to do a bit of courting and take a girl somewhere, you went round to this bus garage and you got her in the back of one of these double-decker buses and went upstairs. <laughs> and I'm afraid that's where loads and loads of people so you used to uh, go round here overnight and you'd hear nothing but giggling and, uh, and messing about on the buses. Uh, there's literally about 100 buses parked in the big open yard round the back there and it was all open then. So actually when I met my wife, it was a blind date. My mate uh, used to have a girlfriend and they met my wife one day and they says, uh, would you like to meet a friend of mine? And that's how it started. Strangely enough, I was 21 and I met her on my birthday. So it was quite a birthday present. We went to Epping Forest, we took a picnic. I think we, we had about two or three hours of a picnic. And then it absolutely taunted down. And it, I can always remember my wife, my wife saying to me, because no, I was in, I was in sort of like a nice suit and, and all that sort of thing and she, uh, I took my coat off because she was only in her frock and we, I put the coat over the, her head and over my head and put my arm around her and she says, she, at the time she said I thought he was, he was being a bit forward. <laughs> Unless she was really seriously caught in, you weren't allowed in, in um, girls' houses or, and things like that, and you definitely weren't allowed to um, go up in the bedroom or anything like that. I was um, staying with my aunt, and she, she has neighbours, and they used to come round, and I used to spend a lot of time with this girl. And then I, I went out with her. It was good. We went to the cinema near enough every, every week. She loved cinema. I bought her flowers on Valentine's Day, and was kind of new to it also. I was just kept spending money on her for the first couple of months. Then we, we, we broke up, but not as in broken up as in never see each other again. We still see each other, we're still friends, it just wasn't really working out. And when we sat at this table, there was other people in front of us and there was this girl, she was like my age, and we were like just looking at each other, yeah. And my girlfriend's mom was looking at me and giving the looks at her. So then we were like, ah, oh, I didn't know what to do, and she kept on uh, tapping on my foot and stuff like that, taking the phone out. And yeah, at the end, yeah, she got tired and she went home. We're very proud of our clothes. I mean, I had a tailor I used to go to in Marlin Road, Whites, and I had most of my suits made there. I went to a couple of other tailors that were recommended, but I never found anyone as good as him. But we used to have two or three fittings for these suits. There was something special, you'd be hand-stitched and all sorts of things, yeah? And you took a pride in your clothes, how you dressed and how you, how you look. I like jeans, I got a lot of jeans. I like wearing rich clothes, like Timberland, Armani, Ted Baker. Well, I like the colour gold, I don't know why. It's, it's, it's not the actual thing gold, but I like the colour a lot. I have got um, some gold football boots. Yeah, I got trainers. Normally, Nike Air. Air Max. I was a mod, yeah, with the old short, the, the old short coats, the old Italian style mohair, short coat and drain pipe trousers, and the wiggle pickle shoes. I had the short haircut, a Pericomo style. I wore Pericomo shirts. I, that, I called my last boy Perry I, after Pericomo, and he's now 40 years old now. Um, yeah, I was, I was a mod. I mean, remember the old wiggle pickle shoes and chisel toe shoes, and we used to have casual like uh, salt and pepper suits, mohair suits, you know, always, it'd be, when you went out, you needed to look, you know, smart, you know. It was just a natural thing because everybody else was doing the same. There's 
Shawani and that as well that we wear as well to a wedding. So when we're in Shawani, I would wear blue or red. Like it's a dress really, like it's up to your knees. It's all patterns all around, it's got a scarf. It's just golden, it's just like to dance and everything to wear that it's nice. Makes you feel with everyone in it really, like you're in the Bengali spirit, you're with everything, it's just tradition, you know, so it's good fun. Well, it was a big band music then, wasn't it? I mean, you had singers like Nat King Cole and Bing Crosby and people who could sing, you know, this was, or so I think. It was a lot different then than it is now. I mean, then you started having, uh, the modern music started coming along, beat bop and all sorts of things, and, you know, I mean, you liked all that, but, um, no, music was a big thing. Well, I like salsa, reggaeton. I like jazz. Techno tunes and tectonic. Reggae, for sure. Hip hop. Uh, I really like guitars. Slipknot. Metallica. Tupac. Don Omar, Pitbull. Guns N' Roses. Akon as well. I remember, first of all, we had um, a wind up grabber phone, you know, with the all. When I was boxing, I started buying furniture for the home then, and I bought the first good one. We had a dance set, I think it was called. <laughs> Radio gram sort of thing, you know. And uh, you spoil the records there. Yeah. I got an iPod, yeah, iPod Touch. Yeah. That's what they want I use in the weekend, like to listen to music. But I listen to music in my phone, yeah, when I come to school. Yeah, I used to buy 45s. I still got a load of them indoors. I like the, the ballads uh, with, with Perry Como, but I also like Motown music and all. I love Motown music, yeah. I think it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I listen to you. Bengali music as well. When I'm with my family and that, uh, when I'm at a wedding or anything, you listen to Bengali music and you just get into the mood of dancing and everything, so it's good, yeah. Just move your hands and everything and just in with the music, and as long as you're in with the music, that's all right. As long as you're dancing with the music, it doesn't really matter how you dance. There was picture palaces everywhere. Everywhere there were picture palaces. We had one old one in, um, in St. Stephen's Road. Uh, called the Ritz, and this was a real old bug hutch, really, you know, I mean, it's, they had a commissionaire outside all done up, but um, it, when you went in there, you could be sitting in there and someone would come round with a spray of disinfectant and be spraying the place, you know, while you were sitting in there. But that was there all during the war, people used to go there during the war. There's plenty of cinemas in the East End there. You used to call them the bug hutches and all this and that, and then you had your, your dancing was in your local clubs, and then you had your local town all had their dance halls. You knew, you knew everyone about, you know, sheer respect. Uh, I've got MSN, Facebook, high five. Oh, my high five profiles, yeah. OK, I got a picture of myself there. I got more pictures, family pictures. I got friends. They give you, like, this, uh, like, kind of medals on your profile and, like, says that you're a hunk or cute or small and stuff like that. I find it weird if you're speaking to someone online and you never you never know who well, who you might be speaking to. Like on MSN, when you go on MSN, you might think you'd be speaking to a 14, 15-year-old boy or girl and you're speaking to a 50-year-old boy or girl. So unless you can meet the person face-to-face, -face, I don't like speaking to them like that. By MSN, you just say anything, yeah. You're like, uh, you could be nervous, but you're not, like, she doesn't know you're nervous and she's not looking at you and you can just write. Yeah, that's the easiest part about it. When I left school, I knew that there was no way that I could sponge off of anyone in my family. I had to go to work and I had to stand on my own two feet. And getting married at 20, it really made you stand on your own two feet. And I had two boys straight away near enough, two years difference, and another one five years difference. So I always went to work. One of the first jobs I had was pulling down old lath and plaster ceilings and nailing up ceiling board. And this is what I was doing at 14. You know. But I didn't like that very much and I wanted to go to work with my father had always worked in Billingsgate Fish Market. And it was all casual labour at first. It was pushing barrows up the hill, lifting boxes onto Porter's Head. Until I was 17 and then I got my Porter's licence and I became a fish porter. In this area we was all sort of come out the same mould that you weren't supposed to have too much expectations. You're just supposed to go to work, put your head down and have a decent burial when you died, you know. 
my future goal is to grow up and be not the best editor, but just someone someone who can make other people say, I want I want to hire him. I want to be a professional footballer, but my backup plan is to be an engineer. A musician or a footballer? Police officer. Maybe not SWAT or just a normal police officer and that. Hopefully I'll be an engineer, or if I can't be an engineer, I want to be a PE teacher. I want to be a lawyer or a barrister. My mum and dad haven't done a lot for me, so I want to repay them back, like put food on the table for them instead of them putting food for me on the table. The thing I want for the future is like to have a big family, yeah, nice house, yeah, and I want to get a job that I really enjoy. I don't care if I wish win that much money, but I want to enjoy my job. So I'm from about 18 months before I got it. To love 27. I've just found the world. There's nothing worse than working just for money. That, that doesn't work. You've got to like what you do. Not only that, when someone gets the money, they want more. I was in the ambulance service for 10 years. Do you feel scared like holding bodies up? No, 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 no. no. Uh, it's, just, it's just a job to me. People say you've got no feelings. I said, no, it's a job to be done, you know. Someone has to do all the